Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. Uh, we are available on Google Play, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Play, wherever you guys hang out for your podcasting. And today we are just going to continue with our Judgment of Paris series. And this is, I'm honored, I'm privileged, I'm humbled to have with us what would I say? The architect of what could have been or is the greatest thing that ever happened to California wine or American wine for that matter. But really, when there's, you talk about modern times of wine consumption, there are three things that have happened. Two uh, of them are dealt with consumption. And the, the primary one, which is the Judgment of Paris here in 1976, changed the world of wine. And we have with us Mr. Stephen Spurrier, all the way from Dorset, England. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul. This is, uh, we're, we have so much to talk about. I don't think we can do it in the 45 minutes that we allocate for this. It doesn't but matter. I got, I got all the time in the world. We're going to have some fun. I, wanna, I wanted to start with this because we're going to get into the bowels of the Judgment of Paris and there's so much press mm-hmm. and there's things to talk about. And I, I've had George Tabor on the show. I've had Violet Gergich, Mr. Barrett's coming on, Bo's coming on. Um, you know, there's a lot of history. We'll talk about that soon. But I want to talk about the first sentence of the book. The first sentence of the book says, on an autumn day in 1970, two Englishmen were walking around Paris's posh right bank near Rue Royale. Why were two Englishmen walking around the right bank and Rue Royale in 1970? That's, how did you get there? Well, I I think, uh, uh, let's say I got married, well, let's start at the start. I joined the, the London wine trade in 1964. Um, I'd always wanted to go into the wine trade uh, I'm a younger son, and um, in in England, the elder brother inherits everything. Yeah, <laughs> so um, so I know that too. <laughs> well, I mean that stopped a bit now. So I mean, and we were a privileged family, so there was money around. And um, while I always envied my elder brother his security, he always envied my independence. Yes. So I after university and and that I joined the wine trade in '64, and um, uh, got married in early '68, uh, and um, because of the money had and my love of France, which was already deep inside me, I bought a property with a ruin on it in the Var, Departement du Var, down in the south of France. Wow. And um, and so my wife and I, the day of our marriage, the evening of our marriage, we took our first-class carriages on the Golden Arrow at Victoria to go to Paris and wow. to start our life in France. And just like so that? We, just like that. Well, I mean, I, uh, I didn't bounce it on a, at the ceremony, right. but um, <laughs> for the first few years of our life, whenever I gave an idea to my wife, she said, well, why not? Let's do it. And unfortunately, when I started the vineyard here about 10 years ago, she said, yeah, why not? As long as you pay for it. Yeah, well, <laughs> a vineyard yeah. in England, no less, right? <laughs> yeah, so so um, there I was in Provence, and we tried to rebuild the ruin. We got ripped off. We were far too young, but we had a good time in Provence. And it was, it was, you know, uh, you know, I was twenty six, and she was twenty one, and we wow. just discovered. Well, we we had a good time, and uh, but then we knew after two years it wasn't going to work. So we'd had to go through a total. Um, uh, emigration, I mean, non residents change of residence through the Bank of England because the taxes in England were so horrendous. And we didn't leave to avoid taxes, but we went through the system which permitted us to, 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 to sort of no longer be considered English residents. And um, so, Bella, my wife said, Okay, well, it's not worked out. Should we go back to London? Because we kept our house there. And I said, no, I'm not going back to London with my <laughs> tail between my legs. Let's go to Paris and I'll go back into the wine trade. So we moved to Paris and that was where, why two gentlemen were walking around the Rue Royale in September 1970. And there was no wine trade. There was no wine trade in the way that I knew it in, in London. Of course there wasn't. There's no reason why there should have been. So there was no possibility I could have gotten a job. Um, as an Englishman speaking adequate but not very good French on and so forth. And with my friend, who was a lawyer, um, in the next door, next door block, we passed a wine shop, a little wine shop called the Cave de la Madeleine. 
And I said to Christopher, I said, that's my dream. A little shop like that, I knew exactly what I could do with it. And that's my absolute dream. So he dragged me in and I looked around and, and eventually the owner, a, a sophisticated lady said, may I sell you something? And my friend said, yes, my friend, my friend <laughs> would like to buy your shop. And she that's said, well, actually it's for sale. So we talked about it and um, we discussed it and the price was set. But then what's interesting, and it's sort of almost been a pattern in my life, she got second thoughts because her husband had been a very good Calviste. He'd been a very good wine merchant and he got cancer and he died two years previously and she was just holding the fort. And she didn't see how a young Englishman could honor the reputation of her husband, of her late husband. Yeah. So I said, okay, Madame Fischer, here's the deal. We're coming up to October the 1st. I'll work for you for free for six months. And if you think I can honor your husband's memory, we'll do the deal. If not, if not, not. So on April 1st, which was still April Fool's Day in Paris, they call it the Poisson. I was gonna ask that question actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it only runs until midday. No. <laughs> but um, April 1st, 1971, she gave me the keys to the cash desk and I took it over. Now, wow. in those six months, I'd learned much better French. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the shop. I was already, I got to know the clientele. I was, we were in what was called the Golden Triangle, the Place de la Madeleine, the Rue Royale, the Boulevard Malzerbe, uh, all, all, that, all that kind of stuff. So, and Paris was much more international in those days and it is now. All the American banks were there, all the American and English law firms were there, and they were all in the 8th arrondissement. So I had this English clientele basically at my feet, but Madame Fougere had never, because she didn't speak English, had never thought about them. So the day I took it over, I placed an ad in the Herald Tribune which said, your wine merchant speaks English, ring Stephen Smart. <laughs> what a benefit, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's really how it began. And so within, I mean, I did, I have to admit, I did know what I was doing. And um, well, I, we, we were touched. bottling Val Diner at the time and I got rid of all that. I didn't intend to sell Val Diner. And um, the supplier of the inexpensive, but inexpensive Val Diner, said, Mr. Spillier, you're going to lose half your clientele. I said, that's the half I want to lose. So wow. it, was, it was, I mean, I was young and, and, and you know, a bit of a dreamer. You, you said and, something, uh, though, that what you've done, uh, that you, I mean, I'm going back just from very, when you moved to France. And I, I'm from a family of immigrants. My father immigrated to America in 1949, my grandfather, yeah. my grandmother, et cetera. You know, this is a risk. And, and if you read about Mike Gergic in the, in the book, and he comes from oh, Croatia yes, with $32, yeah. did you consider this a risk when you just picked up and left with your wife and moved to the Provence? And then once you decided to do that, was it even? No, no, we had, we had tremendous backup. I mean, we, I had kept, um, because I was moving to an address with a house on it, even though it was a ruined yeah. house. Um, we'd kept our, our, four-story house in Chelsea. Yeah, so <laughs> um, you have you know, backup, yeah. And there was a bit of money on both sides. And we, we, were, we were young and adventurous, but we were totally secure financially. There was no risk. There was no financial risk. Um, um, it never occurred to us because we, were, we, we didn't actually... the. Uh, I'm certainly not going to say we had more money than we needed. It's, it's not that, but we didn't actually think of financial stuff at that right. time. So you pick up, you move to Paris, you find this yep. unbelievable store. And I love the Van Odenaire conversation because it says in the book, you were wheeling barrels around. Oh, yeah. and, you know, in those days, you could do that, right? You could come in with your carafe and, or your bottles or your yeah, yeah. whatever they call it, and you can fill it up. And you, you could do that in America at that time, too. You can't do it now. but. Um, but you had an idea then that this store was going to be more classical, let's say, English merchant. And I, I'm interested to know why you think in Paris at that time, 
that there wasn't a wine trade of, to sort of, there wasn't a wine store in every corner, maybe like there would well, have been. Well, there was, there was, uh, um, yeah, uh, um, there was a Nicolas store. Oh yeah, he's a famous guy. Time. Yeah, but I mean, they were brilliant stores. They had, they yeah. had wines going back to the 19th century. I mean, they were fantastic. Wow. But, but they were, they re and, but then well, there were a lot of independent stores that were known as Carviste. And then there were three or four real top wine merchants. There was uh, Jean-Baptiste Best, Jean-Baptiste Chaudet, both on the left bank, and Lucien Legrand on the right bank. And it was Legrand that I became particularly friendly and did quite a lot of stuff with. But then, you know, Paris was, and then there were the luxury stores like Fauchon and Ilia. So Paris was certainly not a backwater in terms of, of, of wine. I would say that the consumers, the Parisians themselves, were backwaters because they drank a lot of rubbish. <laughs> and, um, and they were not terribly, they were more concerned with the price of the bottle than what it tasted like. And, and I guess that was what I was determined to change. Every single wine I bought for the shop was a wine where I knew the producer, I'd been to the estate and um, I'd drink it myself. So I, 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 that was, and I, I never sold wine. I just said, try this, you'll like it. And it worked. That's interesting because we're, and we're going to talk about this later because once we get to the Judgment of Paris story itself, but we're kind of confronted with that in the industry right now. Uh, and I've said this many times on the show, but people are bringing in, you know, one euro per liter wines in America, bottling them under a bunch of labels, putting them on Groupon for three or $4. And, I, it's just kind of interesting that we're going back. Uh, seems like there's a part of of consumption that seems to be going backwards, and then we're trying to get it to go forward. So we'll talk about that when we get to the judgment of Paris. Um, so we have this store, and you've now are establishing this American and English clientele. So, the, you know, I'm a huge fan of Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast you know, which sets in the 20s in Paris. It seems so romantic. The movie A Midnight in Paris you know, yeah, yeah. is kind of focused on that. And you said that it was not as international. Uh, it is more international then than it is today. That's... No, no, no. There were more... Paris was still very, very French. I see. And basically, uh, I had IBM. The whole offices of IBM were in the street, next door street wow. to me. Right. But um, the... Average Parisian did not speak English. So although all the international companies were there, uh, it, it, was, um, it was not an international city like, like London has become and like no. Paris is now. No. So, so, uh, and uh, with, the, with my Anglo-Saxon clientele, I certainly kept um, my French clientele and, and the shop was expanding. Um, they used to drop by in the evenings and taste a glass of wine or two, and I used to talk them through it. And um, one of them, they were in um, a law firm in the Place de la Madeleine, um, he said, you know, if you could ever put this in a structured manner, we'd love to learn about wine, because we don't know anything about wine. And the place next door, which was a locksmith, and I don't know what the hell you want a locksmith in, <laughs> the middle of, middle of Paris for, but anyway, it was a locksmith on, on two floors, came up for sale and I made a bid for it at the bankruptcy auction and I got it and found it L'Académie du Vin. Now what's interesting, um, I wasn't going to call it L'Académie du Vin. I wanted to call it L'Ambassade du Vin because I thought of myself as an ambassador for wine and not an educator. But L'Ambassade du Vin had been taken by someone else and L'Académie du Vin being such a I suppose a grand name had not. So hence L'Académie du Vin was formed, which was the first privately owned wine school in France, run yeah. by an American friend of mine called John Winroth and myself. And um, basically that is the base, the kernel of the Judgment of Paris. Had there been no Académie du Vin, the Judgment of Paris would not have happened. Which is fascinating because George says, uh, I was, that's how he learned about it. Uh, yeah, the, the, the well, he, was doing, he was doing a wine course with us. Yes. But the thing is that, that so I opened, I opened L'Academie du Vin in um, late 72, early 73. Um, in uh, 
October 72, an American lady who'd been working on the Herald Tribune, who uh, had become a client of the shop, came to see me and, and um, uh, she saw what was going on next door and I, she said, what's that? I said, it's going to be a wine school. She said, well, um, would you like anyone to help you with it? And I said, well, I think that's a great idea because <laughs> we can use know, the help. I'm running the shop and, and sure. So Patricia Gallagher was American and she, her family had come over, you know, in the late 1600s, she wasn't one of the uh, earliest, but and they came over on the East Coast where she still, well, her family still has roots. And she was very proud of being American and um, not in a, in, in, a, in a show off sense, but she was proud of her roots. And so every 4th of July, you know, from 73, 74, 75 onwards, she tried to find American wine in Paris and couldn't because maybe Fauchon had Almaden or something. Yeah. Uh, but then what was most important, because we had the wine school and we had a big tasting room and we spoke English and we were bang in the middle of Paris, uh, California vintners, producers, and the journalists like Robert um, Finnegan and Alexis Bespaloff uh, came to came to came to the shop, came to La Cadre de Vin, and um, the the California producers brought their wine, and I had never tasted California wine before. Patricia had wow. not tasted California wine of that quality before, and it was entirely due to Patricia that the idea came that we should hold a tasting of these wines to simply draw attention to the quality coming out of California. It was totally, wow. altruistic, totally altruistic. And we'd given tastings, I mean, we'd given tastings of, of, of Australian wine from the Australian embassy, Spanish wine from the Spanish embassy. We were you know, basically the only game in town who ever thought of non-French wine. And, but this was, Patricia took this to another plane and she had vacation in September 75. She went to San Francisco. Uh, Robert Finnegan marked her card a bit. She went to Montalena, she went to Stag's Leap. She went all over the place and she came back saying, it's extraordinary, we must do this. And I said, okay, Patricia, that's fine. We'll do it. But you insist. <laughs> we need a peg to hang it on. And um, because this is going to be a bigger thing and it's, it's, a, it's a risk. It's not just a one-off tasting. We're trying to achieve something here. We're not just showing a range of wines from Spain. And so we need a raison d'etre. And she said, I've got the perfect raison d'etre. Uh, 76 is the bicentennial of the War of Independence. Wow, I've never said, heard said, that connection. And I said, well, you know, we Brits don't really celebrate having lost the colony, <laughs> but uh, I'll go along with that. And so that was Patricia's idea. And so once we got the peg and it was totally altruistic, we then began to invite the, the, the tasters. And we got over de Valais and well, you've got all the tasters, all their names in George's book. And we were very well known. We were, well, we were well known. We were highly respected. We were very much liked. We never put our hand out for any sponsorship or any freebies. And so the tasters, all of whom we knew, uh, well, we knew most of them. We, I didn't know um, Raymond Oliver, the chef at the Grand Vefort. I didn't know Pierre Brejou from the Institut des Affaires and Contrôle, but you know, it was an invitation from the Academy de Vin to taste California wine. So they all ticked the box and said yes. So May 24th rolled along. I went to California with my wife over Easter, which was in April, to make a final selection. And we had six Chardonnays and six Cabernet-based wines. And um, thanks to Joanne Dupuy, who was bringing a group of 22 people, a, a wine and tennis group, she hand carried the wines because I wouldn't have been able to get 24 bottles through the French customs um, on my own. So right. Joanne really kind of facilitated the tasting in that sense. And I gave a tasting for her group, which included Andre Chalachev and Louis Martini, and really all the great and the good, but the senior members of the California wine establishment. Um, 
at La Cambre du Vin. And, but uh, a week or so before the tasting, it occurred to me that with the exception of Herbert de Villene, who was married to a girl from San Francisco, Pamela, uh, nobody, uh, to my knowledge, would have ever tasted California wine before. And I was worried that- Why would they? Well, yeah. Well, I think Christophe Vaniquet, who was the youngest chef sommelier in Paris at the, at the um, Tour d'Argent, he almost certainly would have done. But, I, I, uh, but, but basically, the other tasters, uh, many of whom were of you know, a certain age, and I was afraid that however much they appreciated the quality, they would kind of damn the wines with faint praise, like, oh, c'est pas mal, so yeah. it's better than we expected. And it would go off like a damp squid. And I couldn't risk that. And I proposed to Patricia that I put the four best white burgundies and the four best red Bordeaux from my shop into the tasting and make it a blind tasting. And she said, you can't do that because they're not coming to a blind tasting. They're not coming to a competition. They're coming to taste California wines. I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and, and so, well, the wines are in George's book, Bata Marache, Puni Marache. Yes. You know, there was no... They, they, they were really chosen, and also the vintages match too. They were chosen just so the California wines, if they slipped through in maybe a third or a fifth, they would at least have got recognition vis-a-vis -vis the benchmarks of France. And we chose them in a random order. I just put the names of, of, um, of the wines on a bit of paper, screwed up the bit of paper, and somebody took the bits of paper out of the hat. So the order of service was random. Um, the wines were served one by one, which would not happen today. They would be left on the table, so you could go backwards and forwards. Um, and when the tasters turned up, I said, you have been invited just to taste California wines, and I thought it would be interesting to make it a blind tasting with the benchmark wines from Burgundy and from Bordeaux. Uh, and do you agree? And they said, yes, yeah, pourquoi pas? No, yes. Yeah. And so exactly. why, why would they not? Why would they not? And sort of the rest is, the rest is history. But it was in a series of the idea was Patricia's, the whole package was Patricia's, but I just didn't want to take the risk of it going off as a damp squib. And so you know, the, we made it a blind tasting, with the results, which I mean, no one was more surprised than me, but. You'll see from George's book, in Shadow Montalena, six tasters put that top, yeah. and three tasters put it second. My bet was Chalone. The three tasters put Chalone second. I thought Chalone was going was to come. Yeah, come. richer usually. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then, of course, the results of the whites were, um, were, were divulged while every, all the whites were being cleared away, and that created a little consternation. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, no, not so bad, not shot horror, but I think certain tasters, which would be nameless, were determined that it wouldn't happen again. <laughs> and if you look at the rankings out of 20 in the reds, certain wines get two and four out of 20. Well, you don't give that kind of mark. So I think the tasters who gave those marks recognized them as California quite yes, correctly. That makes and wanted sense. to completely slam them. And so it's always been in the back of my mind that Stag's Leap from four-year-old vines, 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, um, with Andre Chelichev as a wine advisor, um, was so elegant and un, un burly, you know, so elegant that a lot of the tasters thought it was French. And I think, I think they, gave, uh, they gave it a good, well, it came top. I've run the numbers backwards and forwards, everywhere you want, Stag's Leap still comes top. Um, and I think it, it was the only of one of the California wines which had, which could have possibly been mistaken for French. So that's just- but that, Doesn't that even, 
doesn't even buck the cyst, the idea in, in modern uh, winemaking that you can't make a decent wine from that first vintage of the first four or five, uh, you know, harvests of grapes. I, I, I think that's rubbish. And that apparently. <laughs> so. I, I think, well, no, I mean, I think that's rubbish because, I mean, the vines are that <laughs> to produce grapes. And that's what they want to do. And you can produce grapes and make wine in the troisième feuille in the th- right. A third leaf. So this was a 73. And um, Warren had planted in 1970. So actually they were in the 70, 71, 72. So they were in their fourth leaf. So this was basically their second vintage. But I don't think Warren had... Anyway, if he'd made a 72, I didn't know about it. Um, my bet for the Reds was Ridge. And Ridge eventually in 2006 ended up wiping the floor with everything. But um, you know, it was an absolute fair blind tasting, as George recorded, and all the tasters, without exception, when they got back to where they lived in Bordeaux or Burgundy or wherever, got a really hard time of having betrayed France. And not a single one of them mentioned that to me until the 30th anniversary in 2006. And those really? of them who were still alive uh, said, you know, Stephen, we can tell you now, but we really suffered. Wow. Yeah. Well, and I can I'm, imagine. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't well, supposed yeah, to happen. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah Brejou, who was the, the uh, um, director of the Institut des Appellations Contrôlées, was asked to resign. And uh, Pierre Terry of Chateau who was the mayor of Margot, was suggested he resign. As mayor, really? I know, all this kind of stuff. Of this. They never, yeah, they never told me because they knew that the tasting had been held in honest circumstances. Well, tell me about the. Uh, I'm, I want to read you something in a second, but tell me then, because this is, I've read this many times about. I think the wine trade in Bordeaux in the '70s was suffering a little bit of a dip. There was some issues. I know that. Uh, Bordeaux was classically uh, uh, English trade. Basically, you would bottle in England, or you would you know had control of the negotiant sta- status. Was was well, no, that a, a real they, thing they at were, the time? No, they were, they were by seventy six. They were they were fine. They were fine. Um, okay. But the big scandal was the cruise scandal was seventy three, seventy two, seventy three, the Seven Days War or whatever. The well, Melvin, our friend Melvin, he yes. lost everything in seventy two, seventy three. So they had recovered. Uh, the 72 vintage was terrible. The 73 vintage wasn't too bad. Bordeaux had recovered by 76. It wasn't economically very secure, but they weren't suffering as they had been three or four years previously. Prior to that. But they didn't need the competition. They did not need to be told that Cathay <laughs> yeah, not- from Napa Valley had beaten them. That's not going to help. <laughs> Let me. I want to read you something from my dad. This is my father's newsletter, uh, August yeah. seventy six. He says, uh, he actually he reprints the column from the Time Magazine, June seventh, Time Magazine. But then he writes, "We received the official results from Mister Spurrier's L'Académie de Vin, twenty five Rue Royale, Paris, and reproduced them here for you. The twenty point system was used, and the results are shown as total points. The tastings were held blind." And then he, he lists the winners and, and goes on. He says, a remarkable accomplishment for Jim Barrett of Chateau Montalena and for Warren Winiarski of Stag's Leap. Jim is a local Palace Verdes resident and a practicing attorney of Torrance, spends his weekends at the winery. Warren has been a friend of the Palace Verdes Wines and Spirits, as Jim has, and gives us a visit whenever he's in town. Now, I learned, I mean, I knew Mr. Barrett was a local person. I used to surf with the youngest son, Kevin. Mm. Um, and the, the older brother, uh, Bo, now is the owner and winemaker. But... Um, uh, I didn't know Warren Winiarski slept in my brother's room, you know, when he came into town and that just befuddled me. But then, and I'm just taking you back just for a second, chapter 16 of the book, I want you to just reflect on this. Chapter 16 of the book starts with, in the summer of 1975, Patricia Gallagher was making plans to visit her sister in Palos Verdes Estates, the wealthy coastal community such as uh, south of Los Angeles goes on to talk about your relationship with her. So I told this to my father. He's 92 now. And this is about, I don't know, a few weeks ago I told him. I, I visit him. He's in San Diego. And I said, Dad, this is what it says in the book. He says, oh, yeah, she came into the store. I go, what do you mean? He says, well, she came in, 
introduced herself and said what she was doing. Not just the, not about the not about the judgment of Paris in the sense of a contest that she was looking yeah. for some California wines. Yeah. And it kind of jives because uh, back then in L.A., there were only really five stores that had any premium wine selections. My father's, a Duke of Bourbon, uh, Wally's, and a couple others. Yeah. And it just turns out that Patricia Gallagher's sister lives yeah. in Palos Verdes Estates. So I find this connection kind of intriguing for me. And, and uh, I wanted to tell the story that, that you know, I want, I want to continue the story of the Judgment of Paris yeah. Yeah. for younger wine drinkers to understand you know, how all this came about. George says to me in his interview, he goes, well, I think California wines would have eventually made their way into the world scene five or 10 years later. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, but you, we wouldn't be having this conversation because it, it was an event. It was a turning event. And it, the, the, the migration, a slow migration of California wines into the world of wine would have been uninteresting. But this event made it interesting. Well, I, I mean, I think it was, well, Warren, when he asked us uh, the, the telephone rang off the hook, he couldn't sell his wine on the East Coast. And, yeah, and, so that's and, right. And so, you know, so the telephone rang off the hook. And it was an event which people discussed. It got so much press. And it was an event which I, I redid it <clears throat> 10 years later in New York with um, Sasha Lachine and Bartholomew Broadbent and a real top-class panel. And that confirmed the quality of California reds because the Baudelaire said, you tasted our wines far too young. Well, that was proved, uh, that wasn't proved. And the California wines had a stronger showing in 86. Yes, yes, 30 years later. And no, 20 years. An even stronger showing in 2006. But, but it, was, um, it, it, it was quite plainly a controversial event. And when you have a controversial event, people discuss it. And I think that is what gave the impetus to, to California wine, gave the impetus because it kept on being discussed. You know, what's fascinating to me uh, too, particularly with today's modern techniques and you've got these, you know, electronic sorting tables and they can throw the lizards off of the stems yeah. as they come through the sorting table, these crazy uh, technology. And, but you have these, phenomenal wines that were made in just what I would just call classical winemaking techniques. We did, you had a refractometer maybe and, and a hydro, hydrometer, but yeah. you weren't doing all of these analysis. It was about phenolic ripeness and all these things. And here are these gorgeous wines. Um, in fact, Peter Mondavi was saying it, that the Krug, I don't know, 49 or 52 or something, you know, was scored very highly recently. How, well, how do you... I, the, the, um... Um, Andre Chalichev's Pinot Noirs that he made in the mid 40s at Beaulieu uh, are some of the greatest wines I've ever had. Wow. And they are, they are some, I mean, un, just unbelievable. And, and, um, and, and that was a tasting that I did with a whole bunch of people in 1979. But I mean, they, they were made as natural products without all this who who are now about natural wines? Yes, they were made right, in a right. natural manner, and and as Aubert de Vilaine, who is asked so often how he is, manages to make such wonderful wines, he just says we pick the grapes when they're ripe and do nothing. <laughs> which <You> is <laughs> which seems like the right way to do it now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, seems like the right way to do it. But I think uh, I'd like to bring up a point which, to me, is absolutely key: is that. <clears throat> Whatever the judgment of Paris did for California, and we all know what it, what it did, it did more for the international world of wine. Mm -hmm. Because what it did was to create a template whereby lesser known or even unknown wines of quality could be tasted blind against benchmark and known wines of quality. And if the judges were themselves of quality, the opinion of the judges would be respected. Yes. And that, because it was held in Paris with nine judges, if it had been held across the dining room in St. James's Street with Michael Broadbent and Harry Waugh, it wouldn't have had the impact. But it was, it was an open event and recorded in Time magazine and then recorded in history. And the, that template opened, it, it, it completely uh, leveled the playing field. So that's the most important 
legacy of the judgment of Paris, in my view. Well, here's a, I'm glad you brought up Harry Waugh. Yeah. And this leads into two things I wanted to talk to you about. But one of them is, uh, this is also from my father's newsletter. And I, a couple of months, a couple, about a year later, this is Harry Waugh. And this is about Les Amis Devant. My dad started two or three chapters of Les Lesmi Devant. And I want to talk to you about this idea, maybe, of a current version of things like the Academy Devant or particularly Les Amis Devant, because I think that we need to continue to educate the consumer on Absolutely. what a value of a good bottle of wine is compared to the stuff they're being barraged with. Yeah. But in the meantime, yeah. this article says, Harry Watt, noted British wine authority, was guest of the regional director of Les Amis Devant, where we pitted top Bordeaux and the five best Cabernet California Reds, the 73 Sterling, the 74 Stags Elite Merlot, uh, as did the Spring Mountain 73 and 72 Heights Cellars, Martha's Vineyard, against uh, seven French wines, which include the 73 Lafitte, the 71 Mouton, and the 73 Palmer. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a pretty noble, uh, pretty noble lineup there. But I thought it was very interesting that about a year later, uh, Harry was in Los Angeles uh, holding something kind of similar to what, um, and I'm, I'm supposing that the Judgment of Paris probably triggered many, many of these sort of face-offs uh, across the country and across the world. Um, but what, what's your thought of that? You started Academy Devant for the education of what it seems to be British and American people that were living in Paris. Yeah. And uh, this in the 70s, during this period, my father was around selling wine. The Les Amis Devant was very powerful. There's none left. It's, I've researched. I can't find any active chapters. Yeah. Do you think yeah. it's time for some kind of formal, I'm not going to say formal education, but just a, a social education of wine for people to understand. Very much, very much so. I, think, I, I think wine's all about communication. Okay, it's all about communicating what is behind the wine, the story, the people, where the wines are growing, and so on and so forth. Without communication, without information, uh, a wine, it, it, it sort of can't really exist because the wine can only exist to the drinker once it's in his glass. Okay, but if there's no information, uh, if there's no story, if there's no, you know, you don't go to a movie until you've read the reviews and you know who the actors are, you know what the story is. That's so you, a good point. you're all prepared for it. And, and I, think, I think you're absolutely right. It's something like Les Amis du Mans, which is such a nice name, you know, friends of mine. Uh, yes. You form a, 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 a club and you have recommendations uh, every month. You, you have the wine merchants who will be dragging your hand off to get on your list. And it could be, I think it, it could be wonderful. I, I mean, and I think <coughs> the, the ranking, um, I know Robert Parker is so the wine spectator, but the, all these wine reviews ranking and James Suckling who gives 100 points as though it were <laughs> Easter bunnies. Um, I'll reserve judgment on it. Yeah, yeah, quite. It's got too far. It's, it's, it's numbers. It's numbers and money because the 100 point is very, very expensive. And that's not really what wine's about. Wine is about stories and people and about enjoying a glass of wine with friends. And wine can be $10. I mean, I read in the International New York Times, Eric Asimov's columns yes. are very often reproduced. And he talks about under $20 wines. And he's just been talking about Rieslings, uh, which not many of them are under $20. But I mean, wine is, wine, wine is about consumption and wine They're is around. about communication. You cannot, in my view, have intelligent consumption without communication. And so I think if you... What I think of relaunching Les Amis du Vin, a little chapter of that, it would it, it, it'd do very well. I th I'm very interested in doing it, maybe as a legacy to my dad, maybe as yeah, a legacy yeah. to the wine world. You know, th this is what's happening here, and maybe it's happening in London, because for one, COVID has changed, radically changed, uh, I think, A, the consumption of wine, and P, B, how we buy it because yeah. all of us in the internet world are experiencing a spike in sales, but it doesn't seem to be tapering yet. Uh, and not only that, what people are buying for me are 
totally different than what they were buying pre-COVID. I'm, I'm selling all the brands, Austin Hope, Camus, you know, Silver Oak. I can sell all those things now. I couldn't sell them before. But, wow. but the story behind, what I try to tell my clients, and, and, I, and the reason I taste every Tuesday, I taste around 300 wines a month, is to find these little gems, these under $20 wines that are properly made, that carry a value, an ethereal value past the price and some kind of alcohol yeah. in the bottle, right? It's the story. It's the conversation starter. Yeah. What are we going to talk about? Um, and you brought up this thing about natural wines. I mean, this is, this is driving me crazy because, uh, you know, wine, I got a salesperson. It's natural. Oh, what do you mean by that? I mean, what is unnatural about other wines that you're talking about? Uh, but, the biodynamic movement, I think, is very interesting. The organic movement. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me say it this way. I have so many winemakers that come here and say, I don't understand the organic. We've been organic by nature. We, I don't want my children crawling around the vineyard picking up pesticides. Yeah, sure. Right? I, I, I think it's very different between natural wines. Natural wines are what happens in the cellar. Okay everything else, biodynamic, organic, or whatever you want, sustainable viticulture happens in the vineyard. And they're two incredible different things. And so I've lived without natural wine all my life, and I'm going to continue to survive without it. <laughs> I'm against natural wines in principle because they get away with murder, and uh, as is Janice Robinson. So we, you know, we, I agree. we kind of tend to ignore them. I want to know what's unnatural. I mean, wasn't the, the addition of sulfites is, is natural? Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the Bordelais started that how many years ago? It's a natural thing. It's natural chemical. Now I understand if you're going to put you know mega purple or whatever they call that stuff in a wine to change the color. That's probably no, 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 no. no. But I, I think the 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 original natural wines are the Georgian wines, which have always been vinified in amphora, you know, two thousand years ago, and so those really tastes natural but to use natural wine just because it doesn't have any sulfur is um well i mean it annoys me yes i agree it's, you brought that up the caucus wines uh, i've had yeah, a lot yeah. lately uh, armenia which i'm armenian yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. they've doubled in wineries from 27 to 54 in the last you know few years uh, they're they're most of them will not grow uh, the French varietals. They grow indigenous varietals, yeah, yeah. Adeni and Sireni and Voskahat and these things you can't pronounce. Yeah. But that trade has been around much longer than than the traditional trade. What do you think about these? The ability of well, I'm a huge fan. I was at a wine competition in um, in Romania in Cluj, um, which is just Transylvania, which uh, last year, and the wines are fascinating. Now, of course, they do have Aligotte, they have Chardonnay, they have they have um, French varietals, but that's not their strength. They do very well with them because they they have a European climate. But <laughs> their strength is are their original grape varieties, which yes. of I can't name now. And Italy, by far, has so many a hundred thousands indigenous grape varieties. And they're bringing them out of the woodwork to such an extent. I think Italy, as a European country, I always, if I'm asked, which is the most creative European country at the moment, it's always Italy for me. Um, I mean, France is doing very well, but I mean, Italy is, is, reinventing, is reinventing the past. It's going back to the future. Um, there's, there's a guy. Uh, and, and I said, you talk about Armenia, you talk about... Uh, even 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 Bulgaria, for instance. I mean, I'd I'd love if I had my time over again, I would spend more time traveling around the the, the back the backwoods of Europe. Yes. Rather, rather than the New World. Yes. Well, it is fascinating, and they're coming here. A gentleman was here while in the conference room I'm sitting in last week from Artsakh. Yeah. And he is trying to create a wine trail in Artsakh. Now, this is you know this is eight hours from downtown Yerevan, Armenia. And this is not the, you know, God. but apparently he's got a spa type environment and he's creating indigenous wines and they're very well made. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. Once they get the technologies and the winemakers that know what they're doing. Well, see, I mean, I think everything, he's creating a story from a place. 
And um, there was a mm. long Good interview time. about three months ago, um, the Alfiana Tiempon um, of Le Pain. And she's mm. written a book, which, which my Academy of Divine Library published called 10 Great Wine Estates of Europe. And there's Fresco Baldi and Torres and, and Gaia and so on and so forth. And Fiona said, when people, <coughs> when people come to Le Pain, in the cellar, they're embarrassed. They don't like, the put off by the whole technical aspect of it. They're happiest in the vineyard mm -hmm. when I can talk them through the story. And, and that's it. That's, that, really, so. that really is. It, it's a story. And, and wine, wine without a story is... Yeah. Well, here's, a, here's something I tell people, and I, I, I think my listeners are probably tired of hearing it, but I can't emphasize <laughs> it enough. If you go to the internet and you go to Groupon and you get 15 bottles of wine for $45, yeah. and I know these wines, uh, and you take it home and you taste it, you go, well, this isn't that good. That's not a story. That's not an experience. Yeah. That's, that does no value to anybody. The same with uh, these off, not off brands, but these, and I have no problem with bulk wine. I have no problem with private labels. You can find some very good values there. But I had a, a, a blogger in my office, very well-known blogger, and she was tasting with me on a Tuesday. And I said, while we're waiting for the next vendor, let's open this bottle that was sent to me from a competitor, which is pretty bizarre. But we opened it up and it was Beaujolais. It was French Beaujolais. It was you know, Nothing. real, real, but it was really bad. It was a 16 at the time. And she goes, this is really bad. And I said, yeah. And they're selling it for like 20 bucks. But the problem was when I rolled the label over, it was from Saturday Night Live, the TV show. And I think to myself, some consumer saw something somewhere. Oh, Saturday Night Live. And I'm a fan. Let me buy the bottle and I'll have my friends come over and they open this stuff up and they cannot say, this is even palatable. It's just not good. Hmm. And where's the, where's the story and the experience in that? There was a story, but they, but it was a false well, story. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of hype. I mean, wine is is wine is sold. Um, well, I mean, a lot of wine is sold with no real reflection of what it's made, where it's made, and what it's made from. Yes, so it's sold as a consumable product and um, it, it, you know, it, the, the consumer needs wine merchants or needs advisors like you it's back to communication when I was asked years and years ago all the time how can I buy how can I be really confident buying wine and I said find a wine merchant you can trust because you get a relationship with a wine merchant or two or three, and they'll begin to know your tastes. They're not gonna let you down. They're not gonna sell you something which is gonna rip you off. So basically, it's, it's, it's a matter of trust and communication. So I'm glad you said that, because that's what it's about, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. you have to have somebody that tries to understand your palate, that you experiment with, that you come to their yeah. shop. So here's this uh, guy, and they've written this algorithm so you can go to some websites and you can say, oh, I drink black coffee and I salt my food and I like raw mushrooms. And all of a sudden they've built this profile around your palate. And I think this is a bunch of malarkey. And how could they possibly understand your palate through some simple questions? And, and, and I point to this example. The other day somebody came in with a very interesting Campania red, very volcanic soil. It was yeah. fascinating wine. And I thought to myself, okay, how would this algorithm that's supposed to be teaching somebody who, what their palate is even know about this wine? In other words, where would they put this wine in the category yeah. that they would recommend it to you? How does that work? You ever heard of these things, these algorithms? These... No, 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 no. Oh, uh, I, I, I mean, I can, I can, I mean, um, there used to be a book written, you are what you eat. Well, of course, that's right. <laughs> if, if you keep on eating, um, Big Macs, you're going to end up dead because you'll die of a heart attack. But I mean, it, it, it's, I don't, um, I don't see how an algorithm, even with the, all the artificial intelligence in the world, can tell you what profile of wine you should drink. Right. Because drinking is a matter of choice. 
Yes. And you choose what books you're going to read. You choose what movies you're going to see. You choose what you're going to cook this evening. Um, and you choose a bottle of wine. And it's a matter of, it, 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 it's, it's a matter of choice. What do you think of uh, the packaging of wine now? I, I did a, about 10 years ago, somebody sent me, and we'll wrap up with this, we're getting on an hour here. Uh, somebody sent me about a year ago a sample of some uh, Merlot from South Africa. It was in a 750 ml plastic bottle. Uh, I kept it for some reason, and now it's starting to look like the food grade uh, lining is separating. It's kind of disgusting looking. But I did notice recently in a, a local store that there was a liter bottle now of some plastic bottled wines. And of course, canned wines are out here. I did a big tasting on 75 different canned wines. I don't know. I, I'm, I have a mixed bag. I, I mean, the one thing about the plastic bottles is you can put 36 bottles in a case and have the same weight as 12 glass bottles. So from the restaurant trade on the house pour, yeah, maybe yeah. this is a decent um, I'm. I have nothing against wine in cans. I yeah. think that is, uh, um, and we drink beer in cans, we drink orange juice, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think wine in cans, particularly 25 CL cans or whatever they are, is very good for the younger, younger drinker. Yes. Okay. And, and it's to hand, you know, you have a, a can of wine in your fridge, you pop the top, okay, fine. I, I'm terribly against wine in plastic bottles just because I think good wine deserves more. Yes. So, um, and glass, but then now they're making um, paper bottles. Yeah, Tetra Tech, or they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the bag in box, which has a sort of lining. But I mean, I think the whiskey boys have developed a paper bottle um, with a screw cap. Um, yeah, they have it, that. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I'll tell you, the cans I tasted, and, and the, the, some of them came out on top. I had uh, appellated vintage Cabernet in a in yeah. a 187. I had uh, Russian River Pinot Noir uh, in a in a 250. Most of it of the 75 I tasted was over sulfured and just like, oh, we're going to put it in a can, so don't worry about it. And that was unfortunate. But there were a few seller stars that were, uh, they were trying to produce and put in the bottle. If they, and I actually had vendors come in and I would pour it in a glass for them and just say, hey, what's your opinion of this wine? And they're like, oh, it's pretty good wine. I said, well, I just took it out of this can. So they were a little bit shocked at that. Uh, yeah. But the plastic bottle, I think I agree. Uh, what's interesting was, the plastic bottle I have, which is a 750, it looks small yeah. compared to a regular 750 yeah, because the yeah. glass is not so thick. So yeah. the bottles they're selling now are one liters in plastic, and they look like a 750 on the shelf. Until you grab yeah, it, you really it, can't I mean, tell. We drink, we drink water out of plastic. We drink. That's true. That's, that's the only thing that I, that I drink out of plastic. Yeah, that's true. Um, but actually, we don't. We don't drink water out of plastic because we have very fresh water here. But I, 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 I'm against, I'm against plastic and wine. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's uh, there's still a value to the the romance of the wine. And I'm yeah, headed yeah. out of town this weekend. I'm taking a nice selection of wines. I have friends that are learning to appreciate other things than Napa Valley Cabernet. Yeah, and yeah. and I love sitting with them and and popping the cork and pouring the wines. There's some romance to that. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think screw cup takes away the romance. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know, have a the, Australians, with that. the Australians have been on screw cup for 30, <coughs> 30 years. New Zealand, you can't even find a cork. And New Zealand, exactly. And I think you just have to understand that's part of the package. I mean, I, you know, I can't conceive of a bottle of vintage Bordeaux or Burgundy or Chateau Neuf du Pape without a yeah. cork. Yeah. But I'm, I'm in favor of stove enclosures. I'm very much in favor of vino lock. It's more expensive. But I'm in favor of stove enclosures because they absolutely do what they say. They preserve the, they preserve the fruit. And after 10 or 15 years, there's no variation and so on and so forth. True. But I mean, I think it's, you know, it's sort of certain people will frown on stove enclosures, and I think, I think they're wrong. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I love them, personally, because yeah, my yeah. job is a lot easier uh, tasting yeah, sure. through 75 wines in a day. 
uh, yeah. because I don't have to uncork them all. But, uh, but I understand. Course, I mean, you have Hugh Johnson, who, whose memoirs is called A Life Uncorked. He, he could hardly have called it A Life Unscrewed. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> Are you happen to be a London dry gin person? Well, I drank gin in my early 20s to such an extent that... Um, <laughs> you decided not to do it anymore, yeah. Yeah, but I, I did taste, I went to a gin distillery up in Yorkshire um, last year, last September, and um, it was fascinating. I mean, the purity, and we tasted five or six gins with different botanicals. Yes. And, and um, you've got to serve it with, a good tonic, fever tree is a good tonic, Schweppes yes. is sweet. But it, it, I was totally converted. I remembered, and I really only drink gin now in Negroni, one Negroni a year. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I remembered why I was such a fan of gin, tasting the, that distilled gin, because it just tasted so good. Well, during the, my father was born in Cairo, and during the English uh, you know, yeah. rule, so to speak, he became a London dry gin guy. and. Uh, yeah, yeah. turn me on to it and I can't uh, he poo poos every time I serve him something other than like Gordon's because he loves the juniper berry character mm. but I'm gonna I'm gonna shock him I'm gonna shock you I think this morning I just received a case of this and this is now Japanese gin ah and you know of course they've done wonders with scotch and the part that's a little distressing it says um I can't even pronounce it, but then this is a batch distilled with the essentially Japanese and traditional London dry style. So I'm thinking, wow, and it, it is very dry and very juniper berry driven. Well, I like classic that. London. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll send you a bottle. I don't know if I can get there, but <laughs> yeah. 135 degrees. So I, I don't want to take much more of your time, uh, Mr. Spurrier. Yeah. This has been a fascinating conversation. I know oh, the cool. listeners yeah. will love it. Maybe yeah. we can do it again. I, I do need to get to York. And visit my nephew who's at soccer college and um, getting oh, his degree in international business. And when right. that happens, maybe we can meet and have a drink. Great. Well, I mean, if you come to London, yeah, that'll be, that, well, York, York is, well, I mean, it's a couple hours. So, yeah, it's we'll, yeah. Get, we'll get there somehow. Uh, it, right? it is only a couple of hours on the train. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, yeah. far, you're how far from London? Oh, no, no, we're three hours in London. Down you here. are, okay. Well, I'll yeah, make a trip. We're, no, I know we're a long way. It'll be worth it. Yeah, yeah. such a pleasure having a conversation with this well, this and, evening and, for you, this morning for me. You. Well, and um, do progress on the on the Ami Duvin idea. I think that's. Uh, I I really needed your opinion because uh, I've asked a lot of people, but I, I trusted with you and your experience with the Academy Duvin that I think I the think time it, is right. It's such a lovely name, and it says Les Ami Duvin, the friends yeah. of mine. I mean, what, what else? What more do you want? <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> Salut, yeah. merci, uh, abianto. Au revoir, abianto. Bye. Bye.